Verse 21 says, And the remnant, so the leftover, the people, the leftover people, were slain with the sword of him. So the remaining people who survived, God made sure that they were slain with the sword of him, his sword, that sat upon the horse. So God, remember, he was sitting on the horse and he had a sword, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth. So this sword comes out of his mouth. Now let's look at John chapter 1, John chapter 1, John 1. Now remember how I tried to show you the closeness of the sword with the Bible, the Word of God. So it could be when Jesus Christ comes down and then he wipes out his enemies over here that it's going to come out of his mouth actually. So then the sword is going to come out of his mouth and then judges the enemy. But this thing over here where the sword comes out of his mouth, it could be a reference to actually just simply his words. So basically when he speaks, drop dead, drop dead. Or if he says splat, splat like that. He might say, die, die. So, look, this being is, you got to realize this. Is this so hard to believe when he speaks, it will kill? When 6,000 years ago nearly, he spoke and it was created? Creation is far harder than annihilating. When he speaks, man, boom, like that. That's why it's the sword that proceeded out of his mouth because the sword can represent closely to the word of God. So it could be his word. Look at John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was what? God. See, God is closely assimilated with the word. Go back to Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Remember, why would... Revelation 19, talking about his second coming, talk about verse 13. Verse 13. His name, the last part of verse 13, his name is called the what? Word, Word of God. Why would it mention that? Why would it mention that? So it shows that it could be when this sword comes out of his mouth, it's, re it's in reference to the Word of God. So if I were you, I'd, I'd be careful with that book that you hold in your hand. A lot of people, they, I mean, I would have a bad conscience trying to put a better rendition or wording in the sacred book that you're holding in your hand. That's the Word of God. Amen. That's the Word of God. That's why we make a big deal about these different modern versions. Yeah. We believe only the King James Bible. People think that we're a strange little cult. They say King James only cult, etc. These people have no idea how much irreverence and blasphemy what they're doing with the Word of God. All right, now let's keep reading here of verse 21. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Yep, they were filled up, no doubt. <laughs> they were filled up, no, no doubt. They had a very good meal. All right, next time when you partake in the new wine and the unleavened bread, just think about his coming. All right, now here's the interesting stuff. You thought that was interesting. Now let's go to chapter 20. Here's the interesting stuff. And we'll only cover a little bit for time's sake. Chapter 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven. Okay, so that's self-explanatory. The angel comes down from heaven. Having the key of the bottomless pit. Okay, so notice here that the bottomless pit, we see here lake of fire. Now we see a different location of hell. And that's called the bottomless pit. Remember the pit? That is where the Antichrist came out of, right? Well, he's not coming out of there anymore. He went to the lake of fire now. But God's saying, hey, I'm going to put Satan the dragon in there. So the bottomless pit, notice then that hell has bars. Did you remember... Revelation chapter 1, he has the keys of hell. Matthew chapter, oh, was it 16? The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jonah, that's why he went mentioned about he went down 
to the belly of hell, and then he mentioned bars over there. How about that? So notice over here that hell, it has bars. All right, so the angel comes down out of heaven with the key to the bottomless pit. Let's see what happens. And a great chain in his hand. So he's holding a chain. And he laid hold on the dragon. So he holds that dragon, that old serpent. He's also called the old serpent, which is the what? Devil and Satan. Okay, so that's self-explanatory. The dragon's name is Satan. The serpent's name is Satan or the devil. And bound him a thousand years. So notice that Satan is bound with a chain for 1,000 years. People... Have some people, some scholars, of course it's scholars, scholars and scholars, some scholars find that so hard to believe that uh, there is a literal chain. What, what in the world? What do you mean you find that hard to believe? And you believe that God exists? I mean, that's even hard enough to believe. So Satan over here, you'll notice that he is bound with a literal chain to be tied up to the bottomless pit, go to the book of Jude. The book of Jude, please. The book of Jude. Let's look at the book of Jude. Now, it's a bottomless pit. Now, let me show you something interesting here, and this might be something where scientists talk about. Now, I don't know how much is true or not, but then the saying goes, and some evolutionists say this, I don't know if they change their teaching because scientists always update news. I mean, look at COVID-19, all right? Scientists so trustworthy, right? They always change news every month, you know, because they found something that they were wrong about or something new. But anyway, the point is this, is that if it is true, the scientists say that dark matter, that it, there's something about it where it can have solid substance or it's something very hard. And that's something where it can be like unbreakable, so to speak. Now, if that's the case, then it could be, I mean, look at that book. You have to take something hard, not just an ordinary chain, to tie up the dragon. And you know what that is? Perhaps chains that consist of dark matter. Now, look at the book of Jude. Look at the book of Jude. Whoa, that book is something, man. That book is something. Look at the book of Jude, verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he had reserved in what kind of chains? Yes. And scientists and atheists are arguing, this dark matter is eternal. It's everlasting. Well, then why don't you show them Jude 1, 6, bless God. <laughs> show them that and say, thank you for supporting the Bible. <laughs> he had reserved in everlasting chains under what? Darkness unto the judgment of the great day. That book is amazing. And it's something you just gloss over, right? All right, go back to Revelation 20. Revelation 20. That book is something else, friend. That book is something else. All right, so we can see over here that that old dragon, that old serpent, that he's tied up. He's tied up under everlasting chains of darkness. So it's going to be unbreakable. It's eternal. So Satan can't break out of this. Let's read some more passages on what the Lord does with Satan. It's a thousand years long. Verse 3, And cast him into the bottomless pit. So he's cast inside in there. And shut him up. So he's shut up inside the bottomless pit. And set a seal upon him. So it's locked with the seal. Now, notice, as, uh, if you recall, Satan tried to seal up our Lord. The Bible mentions a seal on the, the open mouth or the hole, the pit, of that tomb. Yeah. So he's, Jesus broke the devil's seal, but bless God, the devil can't break God the Father's seal. Amen. Set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. So that way he doesn't deceive the nations anymore. That's the way he'll be locked up. Till the thousand years should be fulfilled. Until how long? Until the 1,000 years of his reign is over. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. After that, 
the Lord's going to let him loose, but just a little while, just a little season. Now, a lot of people ask the question, okay, so we can see here Satan is bound for a thousand years, but why will God let Satan go again, right? Here's another question. Why did God allow the serpent, the dragon, to tempt Adam and Eve, right? So that's a question that's going throughout everybody's mind. But the simple answer is this. You'll notice that because of Satan's existence, it proves, it undoubtedly proves about mankind's sinful human nature what he's capable of. That's the thing a lot of people don't think about. A lot of people, they don't think about, they think that they're such good people. Why? Because they're living in good times. Everything is in right conditions. But you notice when conditions just get bad, all of a sudden, human nature becomes ugly when they fight for the smallest piece of toilet paper under COVID-19. <laughs> so notice over here, human nature, the true reality of human nature is exposed and revealed, can only be exposed and revealed. Oh, we're such good people. We're wonderful people. Everybody says, no, you're not. Unless the test is done, where we, then we can finally see the true color. So God does the test, and that's Satan. So that's why God lets Satan loose. Why? Because as a test for mankind, okay, let's see that for a thousand years long, you're living under perfection, right? So because you're living under perfection, happy, uh, happy ever after, let's see now if you're going to not follow the devil. Guess what? They still follow the devil. Right. Atheists complain that, uh, well, you know, why can't I live in a perfect environment and everything was perfect and I'd be all right? No, because the millennium is the prime example of things in perfect condition and yet mankind still rebel and sin against God. So that's why God lets the devil loose. Why God lets the devil loose is to see how many people are so adamant to follow this wicked being. So mankind at his nature is exposed because... Mankind, during that time, they're afraid of God, remember? Because why? He's ruling them with the rod of iron. And not only that, he scares them by opening up hell in front of them. So because of that, that's why these people are terrified and they worship God, not out of sincerity from the heart. Until this devil is loose, then we see what's really in their heart. So that's the reason why. Some people do not believe that this thousand years is real. So then they do not believe in a literal 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ. You got a group called the Amillennials. And the Amillennials think that right now you're living in the 1,000 year reign kingdom of God. And the 1,000 is not literally a 1,000 number, okay? It's just for long lengths of time, God's kingdom will last forever. After Jesus died on the cross, we've been living in his kingdom forever and ever. Look, this is not God's kingdom. This is the devil's kingdom, what's going on right now. 1,000 years means 1,000 years. How do you know that? How do I know that? Because uh, it says 1,000 years, not just once, but how many times? Look at verse 2. He says 1,000 years. Look at verse uh, 3. He says 1,000 years. Look at verse 4. He says 1,000 years. Look at verse 5. He says 1,000 years. Look at verse 6. He says 1,000 years. Look at verse 7. He says 1,000 years. What do you think God meant? 1,000 years, okay? It's that simple. Why else would God repeat it? Now, I'm going to, let's see here. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm going to show you something interesting next Revelation study. And that will be the timing of the rapture. And that will be at the next Revelation study. Now, this is not going to be some herald camping thing where we date the exact date, you know, an hour of his coming, because the Bible says you can't, but it will show a time and the season of it, which we are to be aware of, 1 Thessalonians 5. I'll show you that. And that has to do with the millennium, the timing.